Presented by Caltech. Hello, it is my great pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, our speaker for tonight, Dr. Linda Spilker, the Cassini Project Scientist. Before introducing her, I do want to confess about how very jealous I am of her work on Cassini. Beyond all the great science you're going to see tonight um, and the talk uh, going out in a blaze of glory, Cassini mission highlights, um, I work on Mars. Uh, I work on both MSL and the next Mars mission, Mars 2020. And um, when we go to end a mission, we just end the mission. The mission doesn't go on anymore. We walk in one day expecting the, mission, the rover to be there, and the rover just stops calling home. Uh, for Cassini, they, weren't, they, they were able to actually plan the end date. They were actually able to plan all of the wonderful parties. They had dignitaries show up, and it was just awesome. We just didn't get a phone call home like our son going to college. Um, but the end of that mission was a fitting end to a really wonderful mission, um, and you'll be able to see all of the great science that came out tonight. As for Dr. Spilker, um, upon graduating with a BA from physics from Cal State Fullerton, she came to work at JPL on the Voyager mission. Um, during her work on Voyager, she won the NASA Exceptional Service Medal for her work during the Neptune encounter for working on the infrared radio, radio meter and spectrometer. Linda is such a pleasure to work with and such a great uh, team player that she was won seven group achievement awards during her time on Voyager. Um, that trend continued to work on Cassini. Um, while she was working to be more impressive, she went back to school and received her PhD from UCLA in geophysics and space physics. It's hard enough to work full time, but go back and getting a PhD at the same time is, is, is really impressive. She's been an integral part of the Cassini science team since 1990 when she was named mission scientist in COI for the Composite Infrared Spectrometer, CIRS. Uh, she's been Cassini deputy project scientist since 19, 1997 and the project scientist since 2010. She's an award-winning scientist. Uh, while working on Cassini, she won the NASA an Exceptional Service Medal for exceptional service as the Cassini project scientist and deputy project scientist throughout development, prime, equinox, and solstice mission phase. She's won internal JPL awards, uh, including the JPL Magellan Award for extraordinary leadership in successfully seeing the Cassini mission through its, sec its second senior review and for communication uh, the first 10 years of operations. Uh, these awards are very important. You can tell by how many words are in the titles. <laughs> She's won no less than 10 individual team awards on the Cassini project. Uh, beyond just being the project scientist, she has a flourishing publishing uh, record, um, uh, usually um, working on uh, ring evolution, where she has 60 papers in the literature, including some that are her maiden name of Horn, uh, if you're going to go looking for those papers. Um, one thing uh, that I did want to talk about is what is a project scientist and, and why, what makes Linda so special at this. It's really simple. Um, the sci project scientists are part leader, part follower, part scientist, part engineer, part accountant, and part arbitrator. Um, basically what they do is on a mission, um, they make sure that all of the mission science uh, is maximized. Uh, and that seems pretty simple, but it's really not. On um, a mission like Cassini, it really took a special talent. Uh, you have to juggle a team of over 100 scientists, each of which has indispensable scientists that, science that absolutely has to be done. Each of the satellites are unique and needs special attention. The rings are interesting and need special attention. The planet itself is interesting and needs special attention. All of the cutting edge science has to be done with limited resources, such as observing time, data volumes, and power constraints. This is even before you take in the engineering constraints are taken into account, like what, what instrument do we, how do we position the satellite, so uh, position the Cassini so that once one instrument might be able to see something, the other instrument might, might want to see, so the next time you have to make sure that you're doing it the opposite way. There's a lot of negotiation that goes on here. And the project scientists really herds the cats uh, uh, in, in this way um, to maximize the science. Um, it is truly a her Herculean effort, and, it, and the fact that Cassini operations went as smooth as they are really is a tribute to her leadership. During the countdown of the plunge into Cassini, the mood at JPL was both somber and celebratory, uh, and it was really interesting. It was really fun to watch this, uh, knowing how many um, individual people at JPL uh, went through this. Um, uh, particular mission. Um, during her time at Cassini, she has led a team that has revolutionized the way we look at the system. 
uh, from understanding the nature of Saturn to the discovery of geyser, geysers on Enceladus to understanding the nature of the hydrocarbon lakes on Titan to each of Saturn's various, various and unique moons that we'll uh, be able to see tonight. The data analysis from Cassini will keep scientists uh, busy for generations to come. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Linda Spilk. Thanks, Luther. Really appreciate that. Thank you. I think Luther forgot to add one thing. Being project scientist is fun. It's fun to be there for the discoveries and being amongst the first to see all of the new discoveries for Cassini. So I'm going to share some Cassini highlights, talk about what it was like in the end, right there for the final plunge, and then share a video with you about some of Cassini's great pictures and great results. And I've actually worked on Cassini going all the way back to 1988. I was part of a team to help define the science if you were to go back to Saturn. So I worked on Cassini for almost 30 years. And that's about the time it takes for Saturn to circle the sun one time. So I tell people, I've worked on Cassini for one Saturn year. <laughs> and that's a lot of fun. In fact, my oldest daughter, Jennifer, had just started kindergarten when I started working on Cassini. And now she's married, and she has a daughter of her own. And those decades have just flown by, from figuring out the science to picking the instruments, building the spacecraft, launching, and then 13 glorious years in orbit around Saturn. And as Luther said, Cassini truly revolutionized the way we look at the planet itself, the complex rings, that retinue, the family of satellites, and the interactions in that magnetic bubble driven by Saturn's magnetic field. This is one of my favorite pictures. It's actually a solar eclipse, and this time Saturn is covering up the sun, and I'll talk about it a little bit more as we go on. Well, here's an artist's view of the Cassini spacecraft, and I realize there must be true Cassini fans here tonight. Otherwise, you'd be home or at Dodger <laughs> Stadium watching Game 7 of the World Series. So I say, go Dodgers. You know, they're trailing right now, but maybe things will turn around and get better. So with that, back to the planets. Why do we explore the planets? Well, NASA has a series of grand science questions to address this. And in particular, are we alone in the universe? Has life originated somewhere else? You know, how did life originate on Earth? And by studying the planets in our system, we can get clues to our origin. Another grand science question is, how did the solar system that we're in and the Earth within it come to be? How is it evolving and where is it headed? And Saturn is just one of those pieces to the puzzle of how our solar system formed and perhaps how solar systems form around other stars as well. Well, here's a view of Saturn. I love this view. The rings are like a giant bullseye around Saturn. You can see the shadow going off, completely covering up the rings. It's just a very, very beautiful view. Saturn is the second largest planet in the solar system. It's 10 times further from the sun than the Earth. And if the Earth were a marble, 764 Earths would fill up Saturn, so truly a giant planet. And to give you a feeling for that, here's the Earth and the moon to scale and the distance between them. So you can see that Saturn and its rings would just fit in between the Earth and the moon. This giant planet is made mostly of hydrogen. There's no solid surface as we know it. You're just seeing the cloud tops and the winds blowing around on Saturn. A Little bit of helium. The hydrogen compresses as you go deeper, turning finally into a liquid. The rings themselves are made of icy particles, on average only about 10 feet thick. These particles can be like the size of tiny marbles. A few of them are as big as mountains or even as big as, as small moons. And so a really a very interesting and very dynamic place. Well, here's the Cassini orbiter and the Huygens probe. Uh, Cassini was a spacecraft sent to explore Saturn. You can see the Huygens probe attached. The spacecraft itself is about 22 feet tall. You can see people in both of these to give you an idea of just how big each of them were. Uh, the Cassini orbiter was named after John Dominique Cassini, who discovered a division in Saturn's rings. And the Huygens probe 
whose job it was to parachute through the atmosphere of Titan and land on the surface, was named after the discoverer of Titan, so quite appropriate. So NASA provided the orbiter, and the European Space Agency provided the probe. Here's another view of the Cassini spacecraft, that big white dish antenna is about 13 feet across, and we use that to send back not only the data, but also as a science instrument. We get radio science that can sample the atmospheres and the rings, also the radar experiment that can probe through the atmosphere of Titan and map the surface of Titan, works off of that. 11 meter magnetometer, but we need a long boom to put those sensitive detectors far away from Cassini so you can measure magnetic fields at Saturn and not measure the magnetic field of the spacecraft itself. A cosmic dust analyzer can measure the particles coming from the various rings and can go through the atmosphere of Titan and measure what's there as well. A remote sensing palette from the ultraviolet to the far infrared and also a pair of cameras, narrow and wide, that take these images that are not only scientifically interesting, but also very, very beautiful as well. Cassini is powered by a set of three radioisotope thermoelectric generators. Basically, the decay of plutonium generates heat. That heat is turned into electricity, and the electricity powers Cassini. At launch, we had about 800 watts of power. At arrival at Saturn, about 700. At the end of the mission, about 600. So imagine 600 watt light bulbs are powering all of the computers and the instruments on board Cassini. Also have a fields and particles palette to measure the electrons, protons, all of the environment around Cassini. The Huygens probe is just tucked out there on the side and then two engines, the main engines that control the orbit for Cassini. Now this is the hardware and the instruments on board Cassini. But to me, there's a lot more to Cassini than just the hardware. And I think that the heart and soul of Cassini are her people, the scientists, the engineers, the support staff that work to make Cassini the mission that we had. And so here you see the people, the, the Huygens people are wallpapered on the Huygens probe, and a variety of the Cassini people are on the spacecraft as well. Now, Cassini is truly an international mission. This is the, uh, uh, an image of the 19 flags of the countries that participated in Cassini, providing scientists, hardware, and just being part of the mission. And for me, that international aspect was really wonderful because not only did you have two sources of funding, you know, NASA built the orbiter, Europeans built the probe, but there was a time when the Cassini mission was threatened with cancellation. And our European colleagues rallied and they said to Congress, wait a minute, we're a partner as well and we spend our money building the probe. We don't want you to cancel Cassini. And so they didn't. And so international partners can come in handy. Now let me, what I'm going to should. show you next, I'll, I'll just go back. I'm going to show you the launch of Cassini. You know, it, it's back in 2004. Uh, I was there with my husband and our daughters. We'd taken them out of school for a week. And they were elated. They were in high school. But what they didn't realize is that Cassini was a pre-dawn launch. And for teenagers, pre-dawn. <laughs> It's early, early in the morning, and it took Cassini three tries, so they had to get up three days to go. We had weather and a technical problem. So here, share with me, once again, the launch of Cassini. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff of the Cassini spacecraft on a billion mile trek to Saturn. Pitch program is in, roll program is in. We have cleared the tower and the Cassini spacecraft is on its way to Saturn. T plus 20 seconds, all systems are go. Inlet tracking station now acquiring data. All systems go. Well, I vividly remember that launch. We were some distance away, probably about five miles away. And so you see this little spacecraft slowly lift off the launch pad. And you don't hear anything, and then all of a sudden, the sound hits you at this very low frequency, and you can feel the launch and watch it go up. 
and you saw Cassini go into a cloud and there was sort of a gasp of, oh my gosh, did the spacecraft blow up because the whole cloud was illuminated and we watched as then it came up out of the top and Cassini was on its way. Well here, this is the Cassini mission shown against the 30 year orbit of Saturn. Uh, we didn't take a direct route to Saturn. In fact, you can see two green orbits around the sun. We actually had two flybys of Venus. We actually went inward first, came back out, a second Venus flyby, a flyby of the Earth, Jupiter, and on to Saturn. In a sense, it was a slingshot trajectory picking up energy along the way with each of these flybys of the planet. And so we arrived at Saturn in July of 2004, and that was just two years after the start of northern winter. We had a four-year prime mission, very successful with that, so NASA funded a two-year Equinox mission. And Equinox was when the rings were edge on to the planet, and a very interesting time if you're a ring scientist. After that, NASA funded a seven-year solstice mission with the goal of surviving until northern summer, May of 2017. And as part of that, you can see in a green box, we had to plan the end of the mission. So we had just enough fuel to get to the end of the mission. We found a way to dive in between the rings and the planet for 22 orbits. Then on the final orbit, September 15th of this year, we plunged into Saturn's atmosphere. So a very exciting time. Here's another way to look at the Cassini mission. You can see the various orbits across the top and the years. We flew by Titan 127 times. Not only was Titan scientifically interesting, but we used Titan to shape our orbit. Sometimes the orbits would be looking down at the poles of the planet, sometimes an orbit around the equator, helping us fly by the moons in the system. So Titan was like having a giant fuel tank on board Cassini, because in the same way we'd slingshot by Titan and pick up additional energy and shape the orbits in that way. You'll notice that there were fleet, three flybys of the tiny moon Enceladus right here in the prime mission. And that's when we discovered active jets coming out of the South Pole, so we added 20 more flybys over the course of the rest of the mission. Seven of those actually flew through, tasted, and sampled the jets themselves, revealing an extraordinary things about this tiny moon. 15 more icy satellite flybys getting in so close that you could see features at tiny scales, maybe only down to 100. 200 feet. Sometimes for Enceladus, we could actually see boulders on the surface of Enceladus. And then you can see the seasons change from winter to summer uh, for the North Pole. I'm going to talk about Saturn a little bit, and here you can see views of Saturn as the seasons change. What's really fascinating is that the shadow of the rings is like a giant sundial on Saturn. Rings in the north, it's northern winter. Rings in the south, it's southern winter. And so you can track the rings. Rings edge on, it's spring and fall. And so you can see just various views starting with the northern winter, equinox, where the ring shadow is just a thin shadow around the equator, and then onto, northern, onto southern winter. Now this is the view that we had of the northern hemisphere of Saturn, and it was a big surprise. Because when you see Saturn through a telescope, you think of Saturn as a golden colored planet. And here, the hemisphere that's hardest to see from the Earth, covered by the shadow of the rings, was blue. It wasn't a golden color. It turns out that the ring shadow keeps the haze particles from forming. And over time, they fall away. And you see this beautiful blue that's the methane reflected from the atmosphere. So right off the bat, we found out something new about Saturn. Here's an intermediate view. You can see the northern hemisphere is no longer as blue, but in the south, as the ring shadow moves south that hemisphere is starting to turn more of a greenish blue. And that big moon out in the front, uh, that moon is Titan. Now here's the view that I showed you earlier, and if you look very carefully at the North Pole, you'll notice something interesting. There's a shape at the North Pole that has six sides, a hexagon. Saturn is the only place in our solar system that has a six-sided jet stream, the hexagon. First seen by Voyager in the 1980s, still there today. That hexagon is about the size of two Earths across, and what gives it its sharp turns, we don't know, and why it persists. It actually keeps the atmosphere separate from what's inside of it and outside of it. So a very interesting and still peculiar feature. You can form hexagons if you rotate a fluid very rapidly in the lab, but they don't persist, and this one has been there for decades. Here's a false color movie of the hexagon. 
The clouds race around the edge of the hexagon like horses on a racetrack. That's, it's a very fast flowing jet stream relative to what's inside and what's outside of it. You'll notice in the very center that there's a reddish feature. That's another Cassini discovery. We discovered that both the north and south poles of Saturn have giant hurricanes. This hurricane, we've nicknamed this the rose. It's in false color, but it's about half the size of the United States, 50 times larger than a typical Earth hurricane with wind speeds many times faster. This hurricane is sitting right at the North Pole. And, and why it's sitting there and, and maintain, has been maintained for so long, we're not sure. There's a matching hurricane at the South Pole of Saturn. We also discovered a giant storm. Once every 30 years, Saturn generates a globe encircling storm. And it turns out in the case of Cassini, the storm arrived 10 years early in 2010. So we're actually there to see it. And the head of the storm actually, the, the, it grew a long tail. The tail wrapped around when the head and the tail met about nine months later. That marked the end of the storm. Here you can see the giant vortex or hurricane, that greenish feature. That's the head of the storm generating the very large tail, tremendous amount of energy. Saturn is releasing as much energy in this one storm as it would over 30 years. So it's like it's stored it up and it just releases it. A lot of that energy goes high up into the stratosphere, heats it up. The temperatures here are 80 Kelvin higher than they usually would be, and unique chemistry happens with this. So this is in the far infrared. Looks like a giant cyclops eye. That's the highest temperatures right at the place of the storm. Saturn has aurora as well. Again, some false color images you can see now looking in the near infrared. The different colors are different filters. You can see the aurora. Here's another view. Uh, this one was taken just recently. What's curious here is you can see the auroral oval. That's typical for aurora, but also a very bright piece of it that goes almost to the North Pole. And the aurora don't do this very often. On Saturn, the aurora are generated from emission from hydrogen. So instead of being the greens and reds we're used to on Earth, Aurora on Saturn are actually pink, fading to purple as you go higher up. Moving on to Saturn's rings, the rings have very simple names, letters of the alphabet. A ring, B ring, C, there's the D ring. Then we jump out to the E ring, F ring, and G ring. And so their names were just named in the order of discovery, and if we discover more, they'll probably have equally simple names as well. Each ring has a very unique character. Here's another view of the rings. Uh, you can see the Cassini division for which the mission is named, the Anki gap, and there's another tiny gap right here at the outer edge of the A ring, the Keeler gap. And those two gaps contain moons inside of them, actually. The, the B ring is the brightest. It has the most particles inside of it. Again, the rings are mostly water ice, some little bit of non-icy contaminant that give them kind of a golden hue. And at the end of the mission, we're studying and actually sampling those particles, trying to figure out what that non-icy material might be. Now, what else might be in the rings? What else might be this non-icy material? Have you ever wondered where your lost suitcases go when you can't find them? Maybe they're contributing to that non-icy material that's there in part of Saturn's rings. Here's another view of the rings. Cassini actually made a movie as Cassini was diving through the plane of the rings. So you can see the rings closing up. There's the very bright B ring, Cassini division, A ring, and you can see the Anki gap. You'll see a moon go by every once in a while. Now watch the bright B ring and see what happens when you go to the other side. There's so many particles that the sunlight can't shine through. So it's very dark. And now the Cassini division is very bright. It doesn't have a lot of material but it glows from the sunlight. If you've ever had a dusty windshield driven into the afternoon sun and you can, all of a sudden you can't see anything, it's that kind of effect with the ring particles as well. And here's the view that you would see with the sun now shining through the rings, trying to shine through it with the very dark uh, B ring that's present. Well, at Saturn orbit insertion, we got one of our closest looks ever. And this was of the unlit side of the rings, a couple of the waves in the rings. When we blew up one of those waves, we noticed that th it didn't look smooth and even. Instead, it looked like little pieces of straw were actually present there, and that we found out that the ring particles were clumping and sticking together, forming clumps big enough that our cameras could actually see them at, this, at 
sat in orbit and searched, and we actually flew underneath the rings very close, pointed the cameras up, and took some of these pictures. Now in these final orbits, we pulled in very close to the rings and then hopped over. We got some incredible pictures. Here's a view more recently. And you can see that they're just structure here from this big way that goes on and on and on. These waves are created by resonances with these tiny moons. If there's a place in the rings that goes around exactly twice, for the moon going around once, you put energy into the ring there, angular momentum. And so you can actually get these waves generated. And this moon shares an orbit with another moon. Every, every four years, they switch places. So Janus and Epimetheus go back and forth. They, one, the inner one comes racing up behind the other one, and then the one further out just sort of drops back, and they just switch places back and forth. So you can actually see glitches in the rings. So you have a history of what's happened in the rings by looking at these particular waves. Another Cassini discovery are these objects called propellers. There's an object maybe half a mile or a mile across, and it's trying to open up a gap, and you get two arms of a propeller the beginnings of a gap. And so we found a bunch of these larger propellers, and in the bottom right, you can see some of the smaller propellers in the circles. And it's really a lot of fun. The propellers are named after famous aviators. So you see things like Blériot, Earhart, Santos, Dumont. So their informal names are named after air aviators. Now this is a view of Saturn and the rings at Equinox. Basically, the rings are edge on to the sun, and it, it's like turning the sun off with respect to the rings. In fact, in this series of images put together for this view, we had to enhance the brightness on the left by about a factor of 30, so you could see the rings, and on the right by about a factor of 60, so you could just get a hint of where the rings are. And if you're a ring scientist, and, and I really like studying rings, this is a very special time because it's the one time you can look for three-dimensional objects, anything that sticks up above or below this 10-foot high ring will cast a shadow. And so with glee and delight, we took lots of ring images looking for evidence of either a warped ring, nope, rings are very, very flat, or anything else sticking up. And here's what we found. At the outer edge of the B ring, that bright ring, we found lots of shadows. Each one of those individual shadows are from objects anywhere from half a mile to maybe two miles in size, and there are lots of them. It's like the ring particles get to the edge of the ring. They can't go any further. It's like cars on a crowded freeway. They just jam together and grow bigger and bigger until they get large enough, like giant icebergs. They stick above and below the ring, and they can cast shadows. So that was very exciting. A good analogy is if, imagine you were in the space station and you wanted to find the pyramids. If you look down at the Earth around noon, the shadows would be pretty short and they'd blend in with the sandy background. Now imagine you looked at dawn or dusk, the equivalent of equinox. Then they would have nice long shadows, and by their shadows, it would be much easier to find the pyramids. In the same way, these are the equivalent of the pyramids inside the rings. Another interesting feature is that bright feature at the outer edge of the A ring. It's half a propeller arm. So we knew there was an object there, uh, the, the small object there growing, and we wondered if it was a moonlet that might break free of the rings. And it turns out this object was nicknamed Peggy because its discoverer, it was his mother-in-law's birthday when he saw it in the images. So he nicknamed it after her. And so she's quite happy to have this, this feature at Saturn named after her. So since 2013, we've been looking every once in a while to see if Peggy's still there. See if we see a little moonlit, new moonlit break free, or if Peggy might get broken up and put back into the mix of ring particles. Here's that favorite picture I was talking about. This is created of a series of images. This is a real picture. And we tried to make the colors and everything just what you would see with your eyes. And if you look carefully, you'll see this beautiful white ring around Saturn. Saturn's covering up the sun, and the sunlight's coming around, refracting through the atmosphere. And if you think about it, that ring is every sunrise and sunset on Saturn, all at the same time, looking at them. You can see the, the E ring just absolutely glowing. There's a lot of tiny particles, and when you get close to the sun, it's just like the dust on your windshield. They brighten up, and they're very, very easy to see. Also, if you look at the night side of Saturn, you'll notice it's not dark. And those portions on the night side that are lit up are because they're getting reflected light coming from the rings themselves. So this is very beautiful, very iconic image. 
And if you look carefully, there are actually three other planets in this picture. So you can see Mars, Venus, and the Earth and the Moon. If I blow it up, you can now tell the, the blue one's the Earth and the other one is the Moon. It was really a lot of fun as we took about 20 minutes to take a series of pictures to get color with Cassini. You have a filter wheel and you take a picture through one filter, move the filter wheel through another filter, and you put these black and white pictures through different filters together to get color. What was really fun about this is we said, let's tell everybody on the planet, we're going to take your picture on this day at this time. So we said, in this 20 minute window, go out and wave at Saturn. We gave them all kinds of charts and pictures, and Saturn's here if you live here, and it's over here. And so we got everybody to go outside. Sometimes it was in the middle of the day in the United States. It was at night over in Europe. That hemisphere was visible to Saturn. We said, your photons will be recorded. We'll tell you at the time so that the speed of light, your photons will get there, and they'll be part of this picture of the Earth or Cassini. And so people around the world went out. We had families and clubs and people with dogs and babies. And, and we said, take a picture of yourself, because we won't be able to see you in this little three or four pixel of the Earth, picture of the Earth. But take your picture, your selfie, and send it to us. We got thousands of pictures from all over the place of people you know, having people take selfies or having their picture taken all out there out waving at Saturn from all around the world, beaches and mountains and night and day. We took those pictures, and there's some software that lets you recreate that mosaic out of selfies. And this was very popular because if people sent us a picture, they wanted to look through this and find out where they were. And sometimes they could be in there more than once, you know, if, they, if you needed a certain, uh, certain color or a certain brightness. And so this was really a lot of fun and a way, a way to share what was going on uh, with the public. So I really enjoyed it. My husband and I were out there waving. We sent in our selfie, and sure enough, I looked through till I could find our selfie in this picture, too. Not only did we take pictures of the Earth, we took pictures along the way of all of the other planets. So here, from a Saturn's eye perspective, what the solar system looks like. So you know, Mars, Venus, the Earth, Moon, we looked at Uranus and Neptune, Pluto, and even looked at Jupiter. So this was kind of fun to make a family portrait from 10 AU. Moving on to the moons, there are 62 icy moons around Saturn. Uh, many of them are far away and probably captured objects. There are quite a few in the inner system. Uh, some of them are very tiny. The largest one is Titan. And if you compare the size of Titan to the inner planets, you'll find that Titan is the size of the planet Mercury. If Titan had formed elsewhere in the solar system, it would have been a planet in its own right. Here's one of the moons, very interesting story about this one, Iapetus. We knew from Voyager and from the ground that Iapetus had one side as bright as snow and the other side as dark as charcoal. And the question was, where did all that dark material come from? Was it coming from inside, from volcanoes or something, or some process from the outside? And over the course of the Cassini mission, we found that a distant moon, a captured moon, Phoebe, the dust from this moon was actually coming in and sweeping across just one side of Iapetus and making it black. So we solved that puzzle. But Iapetus had another interesting feature. Its equator was, was sort of poofed out like a walnut. There's this giant ridge. You can see here it's over 20 kilometers high, and it's old. Because if you look at it, it's very eroded. It's peppered with craters. And so we wondered, could it been, have been a ring, perhaps, that collapsed and fell on it, onto the equator? was Iapetus spinning very fast, and it basically sort of poofed out at the equator. So an interesting puzzle about how this ridge formed. Here's one of the smaller moons. This moon's only about 50 miles across. It looks like a potato. And as you might guess, it's orbiting very close to one of the rings, the F ring. And it's coated with ring particles. You can see it's softened on its surface. Even looks like a giant landslide occurred right here. You can see some of the icy material underneath this thick coating of ring particles. If you go even smaller, here are some moons that actually orbit close to the rings or in the rings. Now you start to get objects that have skirts of ring particles that go out. And they, they're basically probably a core, core moon and then this skirt of ring particles coming out. So moons at Saturn come in all different shapes and sizes. Here's Daphnis. And these moons inside the rings actually create waves or wakes, just like a motorboat wake. You can see a very beautiful wake here, and even a little tendril of ring particles that's been pulled off by Daphnis as it orbits in the gap. Here's Titan. Titan is a haze-enshrouded world. It's basically, this is the view Voyager had. 
we didn't have any filters on the cameras to see through the haze, and that was one of the key goals of the Voyager flybys. So that's why we got Cassini started. We wanted to unveil this world. We knew it had a mostly nitrogen-rich atmosphere, but a lot of prebiotic chemistry, perhaps the chemistry that was happening in the Earth's atmosphere before life formed. So this was the, the view prior to uh, Cassini. We carried cameras and instruments to pierce through the haze. Also the Huygens probe. Here's an artist's concept. The heat shield slows the probe down. The parachute comes out, and it took two and a half hours to parachute down and land on the surface, the very first man-made object to land on a moon in the outer solar system. And Cassini was flying overhead, and Huygens was sending the data up to Cassini. And Huygens survived the landing and sent data back for about another hour as Cassini flew over and went, by the, and, you know, went behind the horizon. And we were in contact with the Earth with Huygens, too, at least the carrier signal. And we got about six hours more of signal until the battery stopped working, because Huygens was battery powered. But as we came down, we got the temperature, pressure, composition, pictures, and actually landing on the surface, heated it up, got more gases coming out, finding not only did you have nitrogen, but lots of methane as well. Here's that view from the cameras. As Huygens was rotating, you were taking pictures, slightly looking down. We got closer and closer. We could see mountains. We could see ridges. Ultimately, we could see river channels and stream beds. And you can see the Huygens picture there, that golden picture. We had a lamp to help us get the color right so we could turn the lamp on right before landing. We saw rounded icy pebbles. It told us that liquid was flowing on the surface of this moon, and it looked remarkably like the Earth. Turns out that methane plays the role that water, play, that, uh, uh, water vapor plays here on the Earth. You can have methane clouds, methane rain, methane flowing through river channels, filling lakes and seas. Just a very intriguing world. You can just make out in the near infrared here some of those lakes and seas at the North Pole. We wondered, was it really liquid? What was it flowing into them? And we saw actually this told us that if you have a liquid and the sunlight comes in, hits the surface, goes off at the same angle, you get this reflection. If you've ever been in an airplane on the side away from the sun, you might have noticed a bright spot going over a lake or the ocean or bright spot crossing as you went along. This is the same effect with a liquid. And here's a radar view of one of those seas. This is Ligia Mare. Ligia Mare is about 50% bigger than Lake Superior. It's about 500 feet deep, the same depth of the Great Lakes on the Earth. And there are a number of these. And so knowing the depth, being able to penetrate to the bottom with the radar as well as bounce a signal off the top, we added up all the hydrocarbon budget. And there's 100 times more hydrocarbons on Titan than what we have here on the Earth. And if only we could build a giant pipeline from the lakes and seas to the Earth, our problems would be solved. I mean, there's a lot of methane and ethane, you know, the, the lowest level hydrocarbons, right there on the surface of Titan. Here's a view of some of the clouds, a little movie of the clouds. If you look at the bottom right, you can see that orangish methane cloud. That yellow spot is another one of those reflections off of the lakes and seas. And then these clouds that, uh, as summer approached, came up in the north polar region of Titan. For the final moon, I want to talk about Enceladus because it was probably the most unique discovery of Cassini. Here's our early view of Enceladus. What you notice, it's bright white. You look at it and you go, wait a second, where are the craters? You know, what the, there are just a few craters here and there. If you look at the south pole where those four bluish features are, we nicknamed them tiger stripes, you don't see any craters at all. So right away, Enceladus looked different. We also knew Enceladus was sitting right in the heart of this ring called the E-ring. That had been discovered by Voyager, but we didn't know what the source of the E-ring might be. We got a clue from our magnetometer data, these golden field lines. Basically, it turned out that it looked like there was something holding the magnetic field off the surface, like a comet, some comet tail. So we went even closer. What within 175 kilometers, we found a hot south pole. The South Pole is 100 degrees hotter than it should have been if Enceladus was just a frozen, solid world like a giant ice cube. And the most heat was coming out of those four fractures at the South Pole. Here's a close-up of one of these fractures. It's over 100 kilometers long. And you can see here what looks like a little bit of frost along the edge. And that's exactly what it is. It turns out that Enceladus has active geysers coming out, geysers that are mostly water ice, water vapor, but you have carbon dioxide, methane, 
hydrocarbons galore coming out, salts as well. So there are over 100 individual jets coming out of these four tiger stripe-like features, and they continued erupting for the whole 13 years. So it, these are actively going off all of the time. We found that the ocean was salty. Our cosmic dust analyzer could measure the composition of the biggest particles. We found sodium, potassium, you know, elements that you would find in salt. So we had a salty ocean with a pH not unlike the ocean here on the Earth. I like this view. Here's another Enceladus. This is a fountain at, in Versailles. Enceladus, it turns out, is a Greek giant. And he got himself into a bit of trouble. So he was basically getting buried here under Mount Etna and, and complaining. And so he has an 82-foot fountain of water coming out, out, out of his mouth. And I took this picture. It's quite impressive. And who knew in the 1670s when this fountain was built that another Enceladus far, far away would actually have liquid water geysers coming out of the South Pole. Some of that material actually escapes. The tiniest particles escape and create this very beautiful E-ring. That little black dot is Enceladus. The bright plume is coming out from the bottom, and then you can see the wisps escaping and creating the E-ring. We also found evidence for hydrothermal vents, a global ocean, but there was an excess of hydrogen, and these tiny particles made of silica, nanograins. The silica grains could only grow in water at temperature near the boiling point. So that was pointing toward hydrothermal vents. Now, we know that there are hydrothermal vents here on the Earth in the places where the seafloor crust is spreading, where it's very, very hot. It's very deep in the ocean. It's very dark. There's no sunlight there. The water mixes in with the crust of the Earth, and it picks up compounds like sodium and potassium and iron. And when that hot water hits the cold water, it basically crystallizes those compounds, and it looks like smoke. So each of these individual, what they call white smokers, are along a ridge on the seafloor of the Earth. We looked even closer, lo and behold, in a place where there's no sunlight, we found all kinds of life, all different kinds of life, most of it with no eyes, you know, blind. What you're seeing here is just from the, the, the light coming from the instruments that are looking at these smokers. So we wonder, on Enceladus, you know, you have the liquid water, it's salty, you have the nutrients in the organics, so the chemistry is there, the hydrothermal vents, could you have life? in the ocean of this tiny moon that's only 300 miles across. Now, Cassini doesn't carry any instruments that could make the measurements to look for life. So that will be one of the questions remaining for a future mission. Now, just a little bit about the grand finale and the final goodbye. It was like a brand new mission to actually dive in between the rings and the planet. And we had 22 opportunities. You'd think, wow, that's a lot of chances. But for the team of scientists, there were so many different things we wanted to do in that short time as we plunged through that it really took a lot of discussion and negotiation. And the, the cats were busy going at it, each with their own desires to get the right balance of science for this particular time phase. So well, why did we crash into Saturn? Why pick that particular end? We had a perfectly healthy spacecraft. The key was we were running out of fuel. And as part of planetary protection, we want to be careful, especially with these ocean worlds Cassini has identified, not to crash into them. In particular, the concern was for Enceladus. We didn't want Cassini, once out of fuel, to accidentally run into Enceladus. We go back there someday to look for evidence of life in the ocean, and we find it. And it's Earth microbes, those that survived on the Cassini spacecraft. So we wanted to make sure in particular, not to impact Enceladus. Now, Titan is intriguing. The astrobiologists have looked at it and said, could you have life that could thrive in liquid methane? It'd be a lot slower than we are. It's very cold on Titan. But they found equations that show perhaps there's the energy there to have some kind of life, so another world that we wanted to be sure and protect. Now, what would it be like if you could basically sit inside that high-gain antenna and ride along with Cassini? for one of those orbits. Here's what you might see. Imagine yourself as you get closer and closer to Saturn, the rings spread out, and in a very short time, you dive in between and come out the other side. And you do this over and over again for 22 times. The great views of the poles of the planet, the rings themselves, measurements in that environment in between. 
To me, I imagine being on the, on the deck of the Enterprise and actually looking out the window and actually flying through this gap, that it would be just a really neat place to be. Just some of those data. On the first orbit, we pointed our cameras at Saturn, sorry, at the North Pole. If you see the red dot, that's where we were relative to Saturn. And the pictures of the clouds just got better and better and better as we looked down deep into the atmosphere, better than anything we'd ever seen before. We actually created two of these noodles. We looked with the clear filter, looking deep in the atmosphere. Then we went back in June and looked with the methane filter so we could see two layers, two levels of Saturn's atmosphere and actually put those together and probe them and get resolutions of the clouds much better than a kilometer. And one of our scientists, he's here at Caltech, Andy Ingersoll, he was doing instant science for us that first night as the pictures came back and he said, you know, I've never seen anything like this in my life. And that's always great, you know, and that, that made him very happy, you know, that he had something new to try and puzzle and figure out. Here are the rings. This was incredible. We knew that the rings were clumping at the edge of the B ring, but now we find in this place in the C ring evidence of clumping, but it's different depending on when you look. We called it, you know, scientists are original, streaky clumping and, and clumpy, extra-like clumping. And so we started to have to come up with names for the different kinds of ways it could clump. But the biggest puzzle is that in between, there are places where it doesn't clump at all. So how can you go from clumping to no clumping and why? So we have a long list of questions just from these series of pictures we got back in the last, you know, in the last couple of months. Then we also took a very interesting picture of the rings from the inside out. So a few weeks ago, in a ring system not too far away, here's what the Cassini cameras did, actually looking at the rings from outside and taking these pictures. It's so cool to see the rings very quickly close up. And at the very top, you're now looking at the opposite side of the rings. And so this was just a unique opportunity to use our cameras to, to take this incredible uh, set of images. And to me, it's just amazing how quickly they close up in just a few frames. We're taking frames like every few seconds and then out to the other side. Not only did we look at the rings and, the plant and Saturn itself, but we're looking at Saturn and studying it from the inside out. What's its gravity like, its magnetic field? And lo and behold, what we're finding is that the models we had, all of our assumptions going in were wrong. And nothing makes scientists happier than to find their models are completely wrong and they get to start over and have to explain what they're seeing. Saturn's gravity field is not what we expected. Its magnetic field is not behaving as we expected. We're trying to find the length of a Saturn day, but the Saturn magnetic field axis and the spin axis appear to be perfectly aligned to within 0.06 degrees. And the scientists say, this can't happen. You can't have a magnetic field that way. It just doesn't work that way. And so we're, we're thinking about it and trying to come up with answers. We're going to get the mass of the rings ultimately. Right now, it looks like the rings are less massive. The results show mass less than we expect, which tells us the rings are probably young. Maybe a comet or an asteroid got too close to Saturn, torn apart by Saturn's gravity, and created the rings. We also flew very close to the atmosphere. Uh, we had the last five orbits actually dipping our toe in Saturn's atmosphere to sample the gas of the planet. Of course, we found a lot of hydrogen. We also found very unexpectedly methane. Everybody said, wait a second, you should find hydrogen and then helium. And you know, there was a progression of what we expected. And we found hydrogen and methane. And so I think the methane is probably coming from the rings. But how there could be methane in the rings? Because we've never seen methane in the rings. So another puzzle of what's going on in this environment in between the rings and the planet. Then moving on to some of our last observations, we took our last look at Enceladus's plume. The South Pole's been in darkness for a long time. We also watched as Enceladus, the crescent Enceladus, set behind Saturn. You can see it happening there. We also looked at the Earth for one last time. We had the right geometry behind Saturn to do that. And here's a view of the Earth, and you can just see the moon off to the side. And then on the final day, we thought, wouldn't it be nice just to make a survey of basically our top favorites of things that we've looked at. Anything from looking, we last look at Titan, Enceladus setting, last look for Peggy, and a last look at the propellers. And of course, we made an iconic and very beautiful mosaic of Saturn. And if I blow that up, to me Saturn looks like a giant marble just floating in between the rings as our final uh, goodbye to Saturn. 
Some of our very last pictures were to look at Cassini's final resting place. What you see here is the five micron image in the near infrared on your left with a little oval for the place that Cassini plunged. And on the right, you can see an image of Saturn. Now, this is the night side of Saturn, but the place where we plunged was illuminated by ring shine. So we could actually see where that place might be. This is the last 90 seconds of the Cassini mission. We're traveling at 74,000 miles per hour. And where we encountered the atmosphere and actually lost the signal was no denser than the altitude at which the space station flies. It turns out that we had tiny thrusters on Cassini firing against the atmospheric drag, trying to keep that antenna pointed at the Earth. But their thrust is the equivalent to about the weight of a tennis ball on your hand. So you have these little tiny thrusters working against this almost you know, over 2.5 ton spacecraft. So it didn't take much atmosphere until that antenna turned away. But the end came very quickly. The spacecraft probably in the next 30 to seconds to a minute was basically melted and became part of the planet itself. And as we were sitting there together in the room watching the end of Cassini, we knew the day, the hour, the minute, and almost to the second when that end would happen. We were watching the radio signal. We watched this green plot with this big spike. That spike was Cassini's heartbeat, our link to the Earth with Cassini. And so we watched. We knew when that spike disappeared that we had lost Cassini, and Cassini had become part of Saturn. So I'm going to show you a little plot. The top one is X-band. That's the frequency we send the data back to the Earth. And the bottom is the S-band. So in the final seconds, this is what we saw, the X-band signal slowly went away. S-band lasts a little bit longer. It too goes. We see a little side lobe of S-band. And then the project manager declared the Cassini mission over. And that happened about 4.55 AM, about 15 seconds past that. And it was a very emotional time. As soon as Earl had announced, uh, here's the project manager, Earl Mays, as soon as he had announced the mission was over, he went and embraced the, the, the spacecraft manager, Julie Webster. And so my other colleagues were in Von Karman, that's Scott Edgington, Nora Alange, and Joe Pateski. Uh, a very, you know, sad goodbye to the spacecraft. It really was bittersweet. Cassini did every single thing we asked it to the very last second. It sent back data deep into Saturn's atmosphere, well, as deep as the level of the space station. And all of those data came successfully back. So here's the whole Cassini team. Uh, basically, we all got together. This is before the plunge. Uh, if you know JPL, this is on the steps of 180. We just filled the space in between. And this is just to wave goodbye to Cassini. And just so it's my congratulations to the whole Cassini family. And that includes the public as well, who followed us so faithfully uh, of just such an incredible mission. And for those of you who remember uh, e-tickets for Disneyland, for me, this was truly a <laughs> Disneyland e-ticket ride for Cassini. So what I'd like to do is, in closing, just share with you a movie. They showed this uh, movie put together right after Cassini had plunged into Saturn's atmosphere.
So I look at that and I say, with Cassini, we had a rare opportunity to unveil the wonders of Saturn. And we seized it. And part of me says, we need to go back. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take questions.